Goodrich and Rosati. We uh, greatly appreciate your getting up this early. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's, uh, it seems like it's still a holiday week for some people in the Valley, so thank you very much for attending. Uh, today's topic is establishing a patent strategy that can help you get funding, and our speaker is Michael Hostetler, who's uh, one of the partners in our patent and innovations group here at Wilson Sonsini. A uh, couple of housekeeping things before we uh, get going with Michael. Uh, just to remind you, the next presentation is on Thursday, January 26th, and it will be up at uh, Wharton's new campus. Uh, Doug keeps reminding me that, uh, uh, or telling me that uh, the, um, the Wharton only puts their facilities into coffee, uh, former um, coffee buildings, and it's now in the Hills Brother <coughs> Coffee Building. Um, at t um, number two Harrison Street uh, in San Francisco. So remember to go there rather than the Folger Company uh, uh, coffee building. Um, the topic is uh, opportunity identification, uh, discovering the next big thing, and we're delighted to have Thomas Lee, um, who's uh, currently a professor at UC Berkeley's Haas School. Uh, so that we're very excited about that. Please come and join us. Uh, again, it's in San Francisco, and it's a Thursday, uh, not a Friday. Okay, I was not clear about which one he was. He was in. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, just to also remind you, you can find uh, almost all the previous tutorials online. Um, uh, if you uh, want to take this down as a URL or just remember, it's tinyurl.com and then WEP for Wharton Entrepreneurs Workshop. Uh, program, um, so WEP, I guess we left out the, uh, well, I guess where the, the P comes in there somehow, but WEP workshops is what you should be looking for. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Michael Hostetler, PhD and Esquire. Uh, lawyers a while ago uh, changed their degree uh, title from, uh, to, to, to JD so they could say we're doctors, but Michael is a real, uh, has a real doctorate here. Uh, he's, uh, as I said, a member of our patent and innovations group. He practices uh, in uh, the area of, obviously, intellectual property law, which includes patent prosecution, IP litigation, patent interference proceedings, patent opinions, uh, and IP licensing matters. Uh, he represents over 80 companies in a wide range of technologies, from biotech and pharmaceuticals and other life sciences matters, uh, through clean energy technologies, and uh, as well as traditional IT uh, uh, area. Uh, his clients include startups, venture-backed companies, venture capital firms, helping them do due diligence, uh, spin-outs from large corporations, and uh, a whole host of small and mid-cap uh, publicly traded companies. Uh, he has an undergraduate degree in chemistry from MIT, uh, a PhD in chemistry from UC Berkeley. He's authored a number of published papers in very as various aspects of chemistry. I was going to read some of the titles, but I can't pronounce the chemicals in the names of it. Uh, and he's a member of the American Chemical Society. So we'll have a session after um, the legal discussion if you have any questions about uh, questions of chemistry or uh, <laughs> catalysis or anything like that. Uh, but uh, his background gives him a unique perspective on the legal issues that um, arise in protecting intellectual property uh, given the, the joint knowledge of law and the science. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Michael here today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks, Herb. And also thanks to, to Doug and the Wharton School for sponsoring this event. I think it uh, could be a uh, picture. Oh, I can't do this, right? Yeah, Sorry. great, thanks. Yeah. Just turn on this. Make sure it's got the right slides. Could you come up here, one of you guys, and just make sure I have the slides? Oh. Oh, there it goes. All right. So welcome, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year. It's, uh, I think this is a great way to start off the year uh, with uh, some ideas on patent strategy and the like. I think it's something that every uh, startup company and every uh, investor who's thinking of forming a startup company or, or entrepreneur should really be thinking about because it's something that you should start early because oftentimes uh, what, what, what we find is a, a company may uh, have started off and, and are at the stages where they're 
investors or partners are starting to look at them. And then they call us in and we have to fix things and, and try to you know, adjust the story to make it uh, attractive to the uh, partner or the investor. And it always makes sense to start early. Uh, it, it's much more cost effective to start earlier. Uh, so this is really a talk about how to establish your patent strategy so that you are attractive as, or as attractive as possible to uh, investors or partners. This is not going to be a traditional patent talk. I'm not going to be talking about file histories or best mode or anything like that. That's a, that's a more of a specialist talk uh, that, that may happen at, at, uh, in some other forum. So, but this is really trying to have a, a business-oriented uh, IP talk. So why have a patent strategy? I think there's several reasons to do that. And, and, and one is that uh, you know, it, it really helps you to be prepared for the IP diligence. Uh, almost always nowadays, what we're finding is that uh, whenever an investor does look at a company, that they do look under the hood at the IP. And it, it helps add value because uh, as we'll be discussing later, uh, depending on the type of patent, uh, you, you could have protection for up to 20 years uh, of, of your product. And that gives people comfort that what they're investing in will uh, provide a return for as long as possible, for up to 20 years and even longer, depending on your life cycle management strategy. So I think it's important to have that uh, established because it will be something that, that's going to be uh, uh, looked at. The other is, is to really establish early on how you're going to protect your invention assets. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it makes sense to go and file patents. And uh, at other times, it makes sense to keep things trade secret. Uh, and, and other times, you want to publicly disclose things. And there's different reasons for all of those. And so if you have a strategy as early as possible, when those events come up when you have a new invention or a new discovery or or something you can say well let's keep this trade secret let's 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 patent this let's let's file a patent on this or, or or the like and and i think to have that outlined as early as possible makes sense now you can certainly adjust as time goes by because businesses adjust businesses change and it makes sense to to do that but but otherwise i think at least to talk to your employees and your team and say this is our approach makes a lot of sense to do that as early as possible. The other one is to really manage cash flow, the IP cash flow. To, to be honest, the patents can be pretty expensive, but if you have an idea of how much it's going to cost and your budget, uh, I think what you can do ahead of time is to say this is um, how much we're going to set aside for patents. Uh, this is our patent budget for the next year, for the next two years or three years. And you can put that into your budget whenever you're looking at investors and, and the like, uh, or you're trying to raise funds. So I think it makes sense to have a, a, an intelligent idea of how much it's going to cost ahead of time. And I'll, I'll be discussing that. So diligence are under the microscope. So almost always, I think in virtually every deal that I've been involved in, uh, there's been some sort of diligence, either on the investor side or on the company side. And I've worked on both uh, in, in terms of everything from an IPO to uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, spinoffs of a company, uh, small funding deals such as venture capital or even angels. And almost always there is some level of, of uh, IP diligence. And uh, what it is is I, I find that in general the bill of health, uh, so to speak, uh, is directly related to your IP assets. And one way of thinking about that is, is twofold. One is it, if you have protection for a strategy for protection for 10, 20, 25 years, what that does is it gives the investors confidence that they're going to have a return on money as long as possible. Uh, conversely, if you're going to be partnering with someone, very oftentimes the terms of the license deal uh, are, are tied to the life of the patent. The, 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 the license will last as long as the patent is, uh, as, as long as there's a valid patent. So if you have a life cycle management strategy that has it pegged out for 20 or 25 years, then you know, that then your ability to get returns on your license lasts as long as possible. The other thing that, to note is, although uh, the level of scrutiny varies 
based on the size of the deal. Uh, there is a standard checklist that everyone goes through. When I do diligence on a company, uh, whether it's for an IPO or for an angel, it's the same checklist that you go through. And, and so I think it makes sense to be prepared and there's basically six points. And so you go through those six points and make sure that each of those are adopted for your company. I'll go over those six points, but it's a, it's a standard uh, checklist. So although the level of scrutiny varies, uh, and I'll point out, for example, for lower end deals, like say you're trying to raise 500,000 or a million dollars, those are sort of the lower end deals where uh, the diligence uh, may be set at around $10,000. Uh, uh, and so, you know, there's only so much that someone can do for $10,000 and looking un under your hood. On the other hand, if it's a million dollars, it could be a lot different. Yes? Is, is it okay to take questions while you go, or do you want to wait till the end? Um, yeah, thanks for, for bringing that up, though. If you do have questions uh, during, as I go, please raise your hand. I'm happy to take them as we, as we go. Well, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll go over a little bit of that in the talk itself because it will differentiate some of the things that can be patented and things that can't be patented. But I think it makes sense for every company to at least say, do we need a patent strategy as early as possible? So one of the things you can look at and say, uh, is this the type of company that should have a patent strategy or is it the type of company that shouldn't have a patent strategy? I would say from what I've seen in, in general, uh, everything from medical devices, from biotech, uh, pharmaceuticals, those clearly always have a, 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 a defined patent strategy from the beginning, diagnostics and the like. Uh, when you go to CS and Infotech, uh, they oftentimes have a, a, a patent strategy also. The, the few instances where I haven't seen a, uh, the, the need for a patent strategy was where your company's advantage was based on something other than clearly uh, the invention itself. For example, you, were, um, you see that there's an opportunity out there and another company has already plowed the path and you're gonna come in and you're gonna just do it better or you're gonna have a better team or you're gonna be based on your connections, uh, the management's connections with industry. If it's based on that, then you don't really need to have a a patent filing strategy. You may want to make sure that your company has freedom to operate, that someone else isn't blocking you. But you may not need that if your competitive advantage is based on your management or some other uh, opportunity. Uh, for example, one of the companies that I worked with, um, a software company, they had uh, employed the best graphic designers in the industry out of Disney. And they hired them and, and, and made the best looking graphics around. And at that point, it, was, it didn't really make sense to have a patent strategy because their competitive advantage was that they had hired the very best people. They had basically gone under the radar for three years and developed a full program uh, for, for educational software. At that point, it wasn't necessary to do a patent because they were already three years ahead of the game uh, because of the people that they had hired and the product that they had developed. So sometimes I think if your advantage is something other than uh, purely the innovation side, then, uh, that, then you don't need a patent strategy, yes? So I have one more question, and then I'll hold my fire. So there's been this explosion of companies in the e-commerce and social media and gaming and web 2.0 space. As a general premise, should they or do they have patent strategies, or do they simply fall back to proprietary intellectual property? It varies. Uh, I think um, if the company, when, they, when, that, when I talk to them, and they say that we have something that's completely different, we have a new way of doing online gaming, um, or we have a, a, a new way of, uh, uh, of setting together ne social networks, uh, then uh, they often do want to have a patent filing just so that they uh, can, for example, that they or they make sure that no one can go against them. So they want to be the first filer 
so that someone can't come up and, and, and try to knock them down. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, but it's not always the case. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis. I think uh, the other way of looking at patents is I'm going to file a patent. Will I be able to demonstrate that someone else is doing my stuff? Um, if it's all based on code and the like that may not be apparent from the face of the program, then it may not make sense to file a patent. Because how are you going to show that someone else is doing what you patented? If you can't, if, 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 it, if it's not possible or not easy to show infringement, then it doesn't make sense. Another example, for example, uh, it might be uh, in the uh, clean tech area. If you're making uh, an approved way of making ethanol, it may not make sense to patent that. And the reason being is ethanol is ethanol. No matter what, you can't show that this jug of ethanol was made by your process as opposed to someone else's process. It may not make sense to have a patent in that case because you couldn't show that, even if you got someone else's jug of ethanol, you couldn't show that that jug of ethanol was made by you if it was imported from, say, China or Mexico. So it's, it's a, it's, the other way of looking at it is, could you actually show that someone was infringing your patents? If it doesn't, if it's not possible to do that, then trade secrets are the best way to go. So the, the first point that always happens under diligence is, uh, I think it makes sense to match the IP strategy with the business strategy. So the very first people that are going to be met whenever you're dealing with an investor or a partner are going to be the business people. You guys and, and, and ladies are going to be uh, presenting uh, to a, a partner. And you're going to say, here's our business strategy. We're a social media company, but we believe that we have an advantage because we have a brand new way of, uh, of scraping together people. Or we're, uh, 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 we have a new uh, device uh, that will allow uh, people to, uh, to, to watch TV on, on, their, on, on their iPhones, or we have a new diagnostic method. Uh, and, and so you're going to be talking about your business advantage to business people. What will happen then is it makes sense if your IP people reiterate that, they reinforce it. Um, the worst possible circumstances that I've seen is uh, I do diligence on, on a company. I do diligence on a company. And, uh, and, and the situation comes up where all, they, all the other side can say is, they told us to file these patents, and these are the patents. And then you know, that, that doesn't tie anything together. It looks somewhat random. It looks pell-mell. But, it, but, it, but it's a nice story if I am reiterating basically exactly what the business people said. I am saying we have a platform technology. And as a result of that, we have a series of platform patents. Or alternatively, that we're a fast follower. Someone else developed this social media uh, style, but we believe that we can do something better. And here's our advantage. And we have a patent that covers this. And we believe that we're clear of all other patents that the giants out there have. Um, and so it makes sense. Uh, particularly for, to bring your IP person in as early as possible and so that they know the business strategy just because it makes sense. I mean, if I'm, if I'm not just talking patents and, and, and it makes no sense as to what the business people just pitched, then there's going to be this disconnect. And so I think the very first thing of this is to, to make sure that your IP person really does understand your business strategy and that the filings that are out there and the filings that are out there for your company reiterate that whole process. So you know, the whole question is, is what can be patented? So this is sort of a, a patent diversion. Uh, and I think uh, it may make sense to just go into this real quickly, because it, it's a question that people often raise. What, what can be patented? So there's, some of the things are, are pretty clear. One is a composition of matter. And what that basically means is you have you've made something, uh, a, a new chemical compound. Uh, an isolated gene, uh, uh, a recombinant cell, a new, uh, a new uh, device, uh, a handheld device, or, or, or the like. So that's the composition of matter. Those are the things that um, anything, it's something that was made by the hand of man or, or a person. The other is a machine, uh, and, and that's 
categorized different by the patent office. The, in many ways, it, it sort of goes along the lines of a composition of matter. It's something that you can understand that we have this new machine, we have this new composition of matter, it can be patented. The other though is pro as a process. Um, and as what I mean by a process, and this can even be uh, you know, the, the so-called business methods, um, uh, those can be patented also. Yeah. The, 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 the key fact for all of these processes is that at some point along the pathway, it has to involve a machine or a transformation. Uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I mean by that is I, I can't just patent a process where you and I are interacting because there's no machine or transformation involved. For software, that, that's, that's a no-brainer. For anything that's involving Infotech, there has to be a machine. There's the, mach the computer that people are looking at. There's the server, the databases. All that other stuff are the machines that are involved. And so for processes involving software or Infotech, those can be patented. It just may the key thing is just to make sure that you actually have that machine involved. And, and so that, that's a pretty easy thing. The other is, uh, are basically articles of manufacture. So again, these are very similar to the composition of matter and the machines, but these are the different categories that we have. The other thing I like to say that you can patent, though, are what I call systems. And what I mean by a system is um, it's basically a, a, a conglomeration of different materials that make your business viable. So for example, um, let's take Netflix for an example. Netflix could have a patent on a system, and the system may include uh, DVDs, uh, a mailer envelope, and a computer that tracks uh, who has the, the, the DVD. And so that would be a system. And so what you're doing is you're scraping together the minimum components that makes your business viable? Uh, what are the minimum components that makes your business viable? And so one way of looking at that is that is the system that is needed for a business. So don't, don't exclude that. That's sort of a, another way of going after the business methods. But, but ba basically, the key thing is anything that, what can be patented is anything that was made by the hand of a person. Uh, it, uh, and I'll go into some of the, the things that can't be patented down the road. All right, so the next thing in diligence is clarity and filings. So, uh, you know, I, I, I know that as a matter of course, patents are pretty unbearable things to read. They're, they're, they're dense, they're, they're repetitive, and the like. And, and part of that is uh, patent offices sort of force our hand in that regard. Uh, to give you an example, in the United States for a patent, uh, you can pull things out of the body of the patent. It's sort of like a salad bar. So when you have a salad bar, you can go in and you can make all kinds of different salads. And so the United States Patent Office likes the salad bar approach. You just put a bunch of things in your patent, and you pull it out and you make different salads, and you then patent that. Uh, on the other hand, every other country in the world has more of a menu approach. And it's almost like going to a restaurant where you can only order what's on the menu. It's like you go to a restaurant and say, I want this hamburger, but I don't want the onions and the ketchup on it. And they say, sorry, can't do that. It's not on the menu. So it's like all the other countries basically have patents that say, like, it's got to be this menu approach. So if it's not literally on in that patent, you can't subsequently down the road patent it. And what that does is it forces us to have like this very dense menu. And so when we brainstorm with the inventors and the entrepreneurs, we basically have to literally put every menu item down, and that makes for, for bad reading. But on the other hand, there is the opportunity uh, for diligence to make these patents as readable as possible. And, and, and that is really working with your patent attorney in this regard and seeing the patent application as a business document. Something just like your slide deck, something like your, your, your business plan. The patent can be just like that. And the way to do that is to really understand that uh, people, when they look at patents, really, really only look at it for a, a very brief amount of time. So if you only have five minutes to look at it, they're going to look at the first couple pages. That's where you put it in terms that everybody can understand. And the patent offices understand that. So the first three or four pages, just make it simple, business-oriented language. 
so that if I'm an investor, I'm looking at it, I can get it right away, and I don't have to go through that whole body to try to fish things out. The other is just something simple like use of headings. It, you know, if, if we all are like flipping through business plans and you look at the headings and you get an idea what's in there. So another thing is to use lots of headings. It's, it's simple stuff, but the thing is to realize that your patent applications can be business documents and to make sure that it really is oriented in that way. Very simple to do, but it's, a, 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 it's something you want to do up front because once those patents are written, you can't really change them. So work with your IP attorney and say like, well, look, you know, if, if you as the entrepreneur, when you, look, when you look at your patent application, you should look at the first couple pages and say, I just don't get it. This, is, this looks like gibberish to me. It looks like patentese to me. Tell them to rewrite it, or you can help them rewrite those patent applications so that in the first couple pages, it makes sense. And so I think that's something that you as the business people can help the patent side to make sure that that's the case. And, and why is that? The reason is, is that in a deal, like if I'm on the investor side or, or the partner side, I'm going to be looking at this, but I have a limited amount of time to, uh, that, that, the, that the company has given me or the investors have given me to look at this. I want to be able to get it as soon as possible. <laughs> if I can get your patent application as soon as possible, that's going to add to your value proposition because I'm going to see why it makes sense. I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, oh, this fits into this aspect of the business. And this other application fits into this aspect of the business. And I can get it and, and it'll smooth out the process. So don't, too many times I see that uh, business people, they look at the patent and they think this is dense. The patent attorney must, must know what they're doing. And I don't understand it and that's my fault. Uh, uh, don't develop that mindset. Develop, uh, insist on quality from your patent attorney, at least in the first couple pages. Put, your mind in, put yourself in the mind of the investor and say, I get it by looking at these aspects. So I think, I think that's a, 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 the key point of that. The next one is more of a, a technical aspect. And that is, it always comes up, and this is probably the most important thing of any diligence, and that is to show that you own the IP. It seems simple, but in small companies, it is really, really hard. And I, I cannot just underestimate that. And the reason is, is that people come and people go in companies. You're gonna hire some people, and you know, uh, small, small companies are just very fluid. Uh, a, an employee may move to another company, uh, your funding may uh, be cut back, and so you have to let people go. The key thing is, is to establish ownership as quickly as possible. Uh, absolutely critical thing to do. And the, and the reason is, is that, as I mentioned, people come and people go. And, and if, you, if someone leaves on bad terms, chasing them down and getting them to sign ownership rights over is a nightmare. It's expensive and it just uh, makes investors very, very queasy. The other thing to remember is that in California, we live in a community property state. And what that basically m means is that the default position is that you and your spouse, the, the, the default position is that you and your spouse co-own any asset unless uh, there is some other agreement in place that, that counters that. And an agreement in place might be, for example, that you started up your company, you have your articles of incorporation, and your right to certain uh, stock comes from your uh, obligation to assign to your company. That's very important to do. If you invent, if you invent before the company is formed and before you have this obligation to assign to the company, your spouse will co-own the IP. And what that means is that when you subsequently form the company, if only you assign your rights to the company, your spouse still has residual ownership. And if, heaven forbid, there is a divorce or some other separation, the competitor can go to your spouse and get ownership rights to your invention by having the spouse assign the rights to the company. And that has happened in the past. We've been in litigations uh, where uh, it was, it looked like, uh, you know, it was a, a, a lose situation for our company. 
and we found out that the invention happened before the invention date, before the company form date. And, and what happened is we just went to the spouse and got the ownership rights. They had never taken care of that, so please take care of that. When, the, the thing that you can do is when you form the company, if you have invented before forming the company, just have your spouse sign over their community property rights. So technical thing, but it's something that always happens with small companies. The other thing is, is to make sure that your employees have an obligation to assign to the company too, because uh, it, it's absolutely critical that they do, um, uh, because the, you know, that, that's the biggest challenge uh, that we always face, is to try to round up all the ownership rights. And it's the biggest way to drive a nail into, into, into uh, your, a, a coffin for, uh, for a deal. So the other thing is, is due diligence on your, uh, whenever you license something, exact same thing. If you as a small company are licensing technology from someone else, make sure you ask that question. Make sure that you make sure that every single uh, piece of IP that you're licensing is indeed owned by that company because it's something that will come up. It's just, it's an easy question. It's probably the, the gating question on a lot of this. And then also have a strategy for joint inventions. So you're gonna do a deal with another company. You're gonna do a deal with a, a partner of some sort. Make sure that inventions are worked out because it, you know, when, you're, when you're young and, uh, and, and new, um, you can often strike a much better deal than when you're down the road and you're all of a sudden worth something, you're trying to raise money because then someone has you over the hook. So take care of those as early as possible. All right, freedom to operate. Um, so this is a, a, a question that always comes up during diligence too. And what, what you basically need to do with your patent attorney is really do a, a realistic search of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the prior art, that is what has been done before. You can do this on Google, that's perfectly cool. In fact, we do a lot of searches on Google. Uh, you can do uh, searches on US Patent Office databases, they're all publicly available, they're very user friendly and the like, and just do searches on that. And, and if you find something, investigate that and see if it really is a problem. And, but, but there's different levels. So if this is a million dollar deal, um, what's gonna happen is if I'm the investor's counsel, I'll probably spend 10 minutes doing some searches on Google on the US patent database. And if I see something, uh, I'll ask the questions of the company. And so the best way to prepare is to at least put your mind, put yourself in the mind of the investor. What are the key words that they're likely to search? So if you, and, and part of this is your business plan. You're saying like, we do X. Um, and, and so just search on the web for, the, for that particular aspect and see if anything else is out there. Um, and, and so I, a little bit of prevention in that regard goes a long way. It really does. Because if you look prepared and investors counsel says, well, what about this? And you say, well, we've already thought about this and taken care of it. Uh, that builds up confidence and the like. So it, the clearest way to build up confidence is to do your searches ahead of time and really ask the tough questions. If you see a problem out there, face it and deal with it before going to uh, an investor or a partner so that they understand that you know how to deal with it. You've either done a design around, you've looked into a license, anything like that. Uh, but but the, the key is, is to really be prepared. So the question is, what about opinions? You know, everyone always talks about opinions. You know, half the time when I'm in a diligence deal, someone asks if we have an opinion. My advice is not to get them. Uh, they're expensive. They're, they're, there's, there's only, a, uh, I can think of maybe the 60 or 70 deals that I've done, only two or three times that we've actually required an opinion. It's very, very rare. Usually what happens is you have a good IP law firm behind you. The investors Council will ask the questions and if, for example, I represent you and uh, I, I give the answer and it's a straight answer and I say, this is how we do it, this is how we deal with it, that'll be sufficient. A person-to-person -person talk between IP counsels is almost always the way to settle it, uh, rather than going out and getting that opinion. You'll get some firms that will tell you to get an opinion. I think that's a waste of money. We'll, you know, if you insist, we'll be glad to do it, but they're expensive. And what do I mean by expensive? They could be somewhere between twenty-five and $50,000 for an opinion. Yes. 
So what the opinion would say is that there's a patent out there, it's owned by HP, and we're uh, not worried about it because uh, the patent is invalid. Uh, we found some prior art that's out there that invalidates that HP patent, or we don't infringe it, and so we're not worried about it. We, we do something different, and so that's what the opinion would say. Um, uh, but those are expensive, and, and so it's just much, much better to, to, to work it out person to person and, uh, and to spend your IP dollars on something else. You know, we can do the opinion, but, but, but in reality, it's just, it's just not, worth your, it's not worth the money. Yeah. So <coughs> these days everything gets kind of outsourced. So are there options that you can outsource because if they are doing the search and all, and that may be less expensive. Yes, that's a good point. So the question was, what about outsourcing? And can you use outsourcing for searches? And the answer is yes. You can actually do that pretty well, um, uh, to, at least to get an idea um, uh, as to what's out there. But even with outsourcing, you know, the best outsourcing that I've seen is still to do a search and to understand what's out there is a couple thousand dollars. Um, you know, uh, if you could do it on your own, it's not such a bad deal. Uh, I, I think is either you could do it yourself or you could do a, a, have a firm to do it. I think I would recommend getting an outsource uh, if, you, if you start, if you yourself start to turn up uh, problems. If on your Google searches or on your US Patent Office searches, you start to find problems, then I think it makes sense to get a search firm to, to see if there are anything else, just so you can get that comfort level. But if you're not turning up anything, I think it probably isn't worthwhile to do that. You can, you can just figure that other party's patent counsel is going to not turn up anything either. Um, if it's a low-end deal, they're not going to search the world anyways. They're only going to spend 10, 20 minutes on it anyways. So, but, but I think ultimately it's, not a, it's a reasonable approach to do, and we, we can recommend those too. Yes, back there. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so the question was, the opinions that uh, this one uh, gentleman had was, was uh, that he received from a law firm was full of hedge language. Uh, and, and that will always be the case. <laughs> you, will always, you will always have lots of hedging. And that's just because a firm's liability is, is, uh, is limited to that. So if they are too firm on that, you could, you could say, well, you gave us the indication uh, that, this was a, that this was a done deal and uh, they would be on the hook and you will never get a non-hedgy opinion. I, I've never seen it. You may be able to get, you may be able to get a small shop to do it uh, because they'll be hungry for business, but no major law firm will do that. And, and, and I would say, and that also is why I don't recommend getting opinions because it is full of hedgy language. I mean. Uh, it, it's, it's worse than like an S1 with, that has all the risk factors out there that could cause your company to go under. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's of the same order. And so that is why I, I don't recommend getting opinions unless you're absolutely pressed to the wall. Because, you know, I would talk to that other counsel and I'd say, well, look, it's going to be full of hedge language anyways. What, what's, what's the point of us paying $25,000 for that or, or whatever you happen to pay? So I think that the, the thing is, is to try to get the other side to understand that me saying this personally, orally, is much better than putting it on paper. Michael, uh, what about the ability to get a insurance in that case? Uh, can you get, uh, I mean, a lot of times, uh, like when we have things that we give on a corporate side, it's like this is not an insurance policy. This is a, uh, giving you a legal judgment. But if you really want to be protected and have money behind it, go get insurance. Is that possible? in the yeah, so the question is about patent insurance. It's unusual, Herb, but it really is. We, we sometimes see it. Uh, I would say the only instance where that would be the case where there was clearly a gorilla out there. Say, for example, that there, this is a competitive field. 
uh, it may make sense to, to, do, to do that. Or if you, for example, in your searches you see a, a troll out there, there's a, a series of troll patents, and you see that they are very litigious. It might make sense to get insurance in that particular situation. But the typical run-of-the-mill case, it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, what rights does a U.S. patent grant? The, the key is, is it, it's a right to exclude. So when you get a patent, all that means is that you can stop other people, but it doesn't mean that you can do anything yourself. So that's a key thing to remember. You can stop other people, but it doesn't mean that you can actually do what's in the patent. If someone else has a, a, a dominant patent over you, you can't do anything. So it's, it's just a right to exclude. The other thing is it's 20 years from uh, the, the filing date. So I, I think the time frame is, is useful to know. Patentability. You know, the other thing that people really always look at in diligence matters is to make sure that the patent uh, covers your product, that your product is covered. And so uh, there's several ways that you can do that, even for an early stage company. And that's why I bring up this one issue of accelerate if possible. There are two countries in which acceleration is very easy to do. The United Kingdom, for about uh, three or $4,000, you can more or less get your patent uh, to be examined and granted, if, it's, if, it, if, it, if it can be granted, within a year. And what that, that's a very viable thing to do because you can then say, well, if what happened in uh, the United Kingdom will happen in Europe. And, and that's generally the case. So this is a good way of showing that you're likely to get a European patent. The other way is now in the US, for paying a, a small fee of about uh, $2,400, you can also accelerate it and, get, and they'll guarantee you that you will get a final answer within a year. So for your key stuff, for your key products, and you're an early stage company, it makes sense to accelerate. Because let me tell you, a patent filing is, 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 is nice to have, but everyone will still question it. They'll say, well, what about this? What about that? But when you have a grant of patent, that ends the story. You don't want to do this for, all your, for, for every filing that you have, but for specific filings, it does make sense to do that. And I guess I should just mention, the other thing is you want to have really a healthy mix of targeted and dominant patent filings. And what that means is some are, a targeted filing is one that is specific to your technology. It's what you're actually going to be doing. And then you sort of mix that with some dominant filings, which you might be able to use to, um, it, it covers more than just your own technology. It's, it's, a, it's an umbrella of coverage. It's, 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 you always want to have a healthy mix of both. Um, basic patentability requirements. I, I more or less covered this already. The, the thing is, is that uh, it's got to have use. That's what we call utility. It can't be a perpetual motion machine. It can't be a method for preventing people from dying. Uh, but, but that's a very low bar, obviously. Um, you can't pa patent uh, phenomena in nature. What that basically means is the classic you can't patent. Einstein could not have patented E equals MC squared. You know, that was a law of nature that he discovered. He couldn't patent it. But he could have patent the application of that E equals MC squared to nuclear energy or, to, or, or, or the like. He could, he could patent the application. So uh, the other thing is, is you can't have purely mental processes. You can't stop people from thinking. It's got to involve a machine or a transformation. The other thing is obvious or clear, it's got to be new. It's got to, you know, you can't patent something that someone else already did. So it, there's a novelty requirement. But on top of that, there's an inventive requirement, which basically means that, uh, you know, it can't be, if someone has a patent on a, if, the, if, the, if, uh, if it's disclosed somewhere on Google that there is a car with a blue handle, you could not patent. Uh, the same car with a red handle. Uh, that, that would be too obvious. There's no invention in changing the color of the handle. But you know, I guess you never know. There may be a way that may be relevant for colorblind people. But nonetheless, it's got to have some sort of uh, non-obvious feature to it. And I think one of the key things really is life cycle management. And that is, look at your technology. What is the expected product life? If you have a consumer product, do you expect this, your product to be obsolete in four years? Then it only makes sense to have a patent strategy that's relevant for a four-year cycle. And what that means is you would accelerate, get everything granted as soon as possible, 
because patents just take a long time. They sit in the patent office if you don't accelerate. So why have a patent on a consumer product that is going to sit in the patent office for six years if your product lifetime is only six years? So match your life cycle with your patent strategy. If you, if you expect your, your product to be good for 20 years, then we can develop a patent strategy appropriate to that. But you want to convince the investor or the partner that that's the case. Michael. Yes. So why 14 years where the patent protection is 20 years? So 14 years is, the, is essentially the gold standard for life sciences. Uh, and uh, so that really only applies for, for life sciences. So you have a drug or a medical device that's out there. It goes through a long approval process at the FDA. Uh, if you can get more than 14 years, that's, that's great. But I think sort of the gold standard is to have at least 14 years. And, and that be that's because that's about the length of time in a, in a, in a life sciences product to, re, uh, to, to make up your investment and start to really make a lot of money on that. Also, why is protection 20 years starting from filing and not grant date? Right. Uh, it just happens to be the way the law is. It used to be in the United States, it used to be 17 years from the, the grant date. But that was changed in 1995. It's now 20 years from the filing date. Which is another reason to really make sense, if necessary, to accelerate your patent filing. So if, typically in the United States, uh, you file a patent, it'll sit there for six, five or six years and, and may get granted. Uh, and you may only have 13 years of life left. But if you accelerate it, you pay the $2,400, you file it today, you request acceleration, you may get it granted in one year, in which case you have 19 years of protection. Uh, of actual protection. Yes? Um, so, speaking particularly with regards to life science, you know, the average uh, time from concept to commercialization of the novel therapeutics is roughly 11 years. Does it make sense to kind of hold off on your patent strategy and not protect your IP in order to be able to um, lengthen out the most amount of commercialization and protection that you have? Generally, what we recommend, so the question is in the life sciences where the product development takes about 11 years. How can you uh, get this 14 years of protection post, post approval? And it really is a staggered approach. Some of it is delay, uh, maybe delaying as long as possible until you file your IND or you, you seek approval. Uh, but, but the other way of doing that is to have a staggered approach. And what that means is you, your first patent in the life sciences might be a big umbrella patent. And then a couple years down the road, you file a more focused patent. And then a couple years down the road, you file a patent covering uh, applications for a specific disease, and then your, your method of manufacturing, and then your, your drug formulation. So it's a matter of, st of, of having a, a staggered approach to your filings, too. So the key is, is, especially in the life sciences, don't front load your application to include everything. Intelligently stretch it out. So we want to wait. We don't want to disclose our formulation right now. We can hold off on that for a couple years. So here's a the patent timeline. Uh, uh, this is basic, some basic patent stuff. And it, the dollar signs reflect, reflect the, the general cost of, of, the, of, this, of, uh, of doing this. The filing date, you know, to, to write up a provisional or an early patent application may cost uh, uh, $15,000 or less. Uh, but but and I'll, I'll go into the patent budget a little bit later. Inter an international filing is 12 months later, although you can do it earlier. Uh, 18 months after your filing date, after this filing date up here, the very first filing date, that's when it becomes publicly available. So that's something you have to realize that the world can see what you're doing. Your name is going to be on a patent, and so you have to realize that uh, that's going to be the case. Uh, 30 months later, there's the national phase. That's where you decide to file in China and India, Canada, and the like. That, that can be quite expensive. Prosecution, that's a back and forth in the patent office. That typically is 36 to 120 months, 10 years after filing, and that, that's a long time. And so, as, uh, as Julio mentioned, uh, we, it's only based on 20 years after the filing date, so you would only have 10 years of patent life if it was sitting in the patent office for 10 years. European validation, that's where you go into, once you get your European patent, you can get it filed then in, in Italy and Spain and, and the like, and that's a very expensive process. And then your annuity fees. So all this is cost that you need. Yes? Given the total cost of this, is everybody doing the $2,400 accelerated fees? Is that, is that the backlog? 
Yeah, that, that's a good question. So the question is, with the acceleration now in place are, 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 and, and the expense, are people uh, doing that? It's a brand new process. It's, it was only passed with the American Vents Act, which came in September. So what, when we looked at it, uh, it, it's sort of a hidden secret right now. So it's one of those things you want to take advantage of because uh, now uh, or in the next year or two because very soon it may be clogged up. But the patent office does guarantee that you'll get a final disposition in one year. So I don't know how they're going to do that, but uh, that, that's the guarantee. Yes? Right, so the question is uh, uh, the acceleration process. So uh, the questioner was correct in that there are several routes of acceleration. One is to basically produce a document from your patent attorney where they, they, they basically prosecute the patent for you. You do the search and all that. That can be very expensive. However, the patent office also instituted essentially the no search um, fee. You just basically pay more to the patent office. A patent filing might normally cost uh, $500 to file, but instead you're paying $2,400 uh, if you're a small entity uh, that's under 500 employees. And you don't have to do the search. You just pay the fee. So the idea is that you paid extra, so that gives the patent office more money to do the search themselves. So there's the search route, which you don't have to pay an extra fee to the patent office but you pay a fee to your patent attorney for doing all that work. Or, alternatively, you can just pay the patent office. Yes? I will, I will in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a subsequent slide. So, real quick interlude, American Invents Act passed uh, this uh, last fall. You, you may have seen a lot of chatter about it. Uh, uh, some people say it's a doomsday uh, device, and others that this is a great thing. My personal opinion is it's great, uh, and, and that it, it basically conforms the United States with the rest of the world. Uh, they get rid of the first in, to invent a law. So in the United States, it used to be first to invent. Everywhere else in the world, it was first to file. Uh, you know, so that's the nice thing about having this law is you get the certainty. You know, if someone does a search and they find that your competitor filed two days after you then you win because there is no more of this uncertainty about interferences and the like. And if you're behind the ball, then you have certainty that you're not going to be able to go ahead and yet to just redesign the product. No longer do you have this uncertainty that's out there and it just conforms it with the rest of the world. I like it. It gives certainty. It's a good thing. The other thing is like this acceleration that I mentioned that will allow final disposition within 12 months. The one thing that's going to make patent law in the U.S. a little bit funky is this idea of oppositions. It used to be it was somewhat challenging to, 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 to go after an issued patent. But, but now uh, it's actually uh, possible to do that. So if you get an issued patent within a certain time frame, your competitors or a third party could say that this, this patent stinks and send it back to the patent office. That is now in play, and it will add to some of the uncertainty and expense. But once you get past that, I think the understanding is that you're going to have a stronger patent. Um, patent strategy. Here's the budget that, that I mentioned to, to go over this, this issue. So, you know, to file provisional is minimally 8,000, uh, more often 10 to 18,000 if you do some preliminary searches to make sure your patent is good. Um, to convert it a year later, uh, it's, a, it's not that expensive. You, you pay the patent office about $1,000 or $2,400 if you want acceleration. But if you want to do updates, I would budget somewhere around 5 to 10K. Uh, PCT, that's an international application that allows you to file in other countries besides the United States or in addition to the United States. That's about $5,000 in, in hard cost. Again, that's something that you're just paying the international patent office. Worldwide national stage filings, top 10 markets, about $100,000. And that would happen at the 30-month stage. So I would budget 
if you were going to go into the top 10 markets, about $100,000. That is covering translations, uh, saying the Chinese, Japanese, uh, Russian, Brazilian, uh, Portuguese. Uh, those are those hard costs. Uh, prosecution in each country that you then go forward in, it's about fifteen dollars to $25,000 that you should budget. But that's going to happen somewhere between months 36 and one, month 120, so that's way down the road. Uh, European validation, to get that into the top 10 markets in Europe. You get your European patent granted, but that doesn't give you anything. It just then gives you the right to register that patent in various European countries. To go into the top 10 markets, cost around uh, sixty to eighty thousand dollars. If you want to get all of Europe covered, completely blanket Europe, which is sometimes important, that's going to cost you about a uh, hundred and eighty thousand dollars because you have to do things like translate it into Estonian and Latvian and uh, Hungarian and stuff like that. Um, maintenance fees uh, five to twenty thousand uh, dollars per patent per country. So just something to keep in mind. And that really is only after the patent issues in, in general. So that's way down the road, but gives you a rough idea of a, of a budget. I just want to go real quickly over global patent strategies. Where do you want to file? And this is important for your patent strategy and your patent budgets. And what I present here is essentially uh, the 2002 and the 2005 the 2008 uh, 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 market size is almost identical, except China has moved up from fifth place in, from 2005 to fourth place in 2004. But this gives you an idea of the world market size for various countries. So you can see it drops off like a rock. Uh, US is about 44% of the world market. Uh, Japan, Europe is about 30. Japan is about 11. China is now about 3 to 4%. Canada is about 2%, and then everything after that is about 1%. And it drops off really quickly when you get to number 10 with India, that's about 0.9%. So you can intelligently file in certain places. You don't need to file in every country. You can capture a large amount of the world market size, uh, a large amount of the available world market by just uh, targeting in a few countries. What we did here is uh, uh, you essentially divide the uh, relative cost benefit ranking. And what I did in this slide, actually what, the, uh, what uh, Millennium Pharmaceuticals did, and I borrowed this from them, uh, is that you take the, pharmaceutical, the, the market size and you divide it by the cost. And that gives a relative cost benefit ratio. And Japan was normalized to 100. So assume that Japan gave a score of 100 in this cost benefit ratio. So you can see that's why Japan is 100. The US gives you a cost benefit return about 20 times higher than Japan. And then you can see Europe drops off pretty quickly. It's about four times greater than Japan. Canada, because it's inexpensive, is about 50% greater than Japan. And then it drops off again quite rapidly. So again, you can use these numbers to determine where they're, in which countries it makes sense to file. The next thing I'd like to show is that you can cover approximately 90% of the world market by going into US, Europe, Canada, Japan, India, Australia, Brazil, Mexico, and China. That's 90% of the market. You only have to file in, I guess, nine countries and you get that much, uh, uh, you, can, you can basically give numbers to your investor or your partner and say, we, we're covering 90% of the world market in, 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 for, uh, and we're doing this in a cost-effective and focused way. Any questions on these filing strategies in, in, in various countries or, uh, or uh, on the patent budget? Yes? Yes, so that's a good question. Uh, if, if you're a bootstrapped entrepreneur, the question was, can you file a patent application yourself in the US Patent Office, a one-page provisional? And the answer is yes, and that's an OK strategy for the United States. Every other country does recognize provisionals, 
But the problem is, is in every other country, unless you have a detailed description and essentially a full patent, it's not going to be worth anything in China. It's not going to be worth anything in Europe. So that if someone with a bigger budget does the same thing but with more detail a few days after you, they could, uh, in general, uh, make sure that you don't get your patent filing in Europe and China and Japan. So if you have a pure US-based strategy, that's a reasonable approach to go, but it, it does not work if you have a global strategy. Yes? Is that one page uh, get made public on the USPTO website? It does. It gets made public 18 months after you file. So uh, the publication date is 18 months later. Uh, and so, uh, but there are, there are circumstances. Again, if you have a US only strategy, that provisional, you can request non publication. And it will only become public when your patent grants. Uh, but if you don't request non-publication, it will publish at 18 months. Yes? So on the same line for the bootstrap startup, like <coughs> people who are in the valley, let's say, working for large companies like Oracle or Ericsson, um, Oracle pretty much covers everything in software. And you are working over there. What's the strategy for an entrepreneur working at large company and filing that? Well, th that's, a, that's a challenge because, so the question was, if you're working at a large company, say Oracle or HP or, or, or the like, and you have an idea, can you file a patent on your own? That's a tough, that's a, that leads to a tough circumstance down the road when you're undergoing diligence, and that's the question of ownership. And so the big question that will always come up is, does Oracle or HP or does your employer actually own that patent. Although you filed it yourself, that's fine. Your employment agreement may not allow you to do that, and it may be that Oracle or HP actually owns that. Uh, it's a really tough situation. What we generally recommend in such situations is you hold your invention in abeyance until you're ready to take the plunge. And several days after taking the plunge, then you file it. Or you have an attorney look at your employment agreement and see if there is some sort of exclusion that allows you to, to get around that. But, but otherwise, y y you just have to wait to take the plunge. Yes, back there. Yeah, Michael, as a follow-up to that question, uh, <clears throat> a situation where an employee is working as a full-time employee at Oracle or HP, but at night or on the weekends is sitting in the garage for a new idea. It depends on, the, the question is if you're doing something in your garage on the weekend and you work for a big company during the day, but on the weekend and at night you're doing something different, uh, <coughs> will Oracle or HP still have the grips on that? Again, it depends on the circumstance. It really does. Uh, uh, for example, the University of California, I'm, I'm familiar with their uh, invention, uh, their uh, employment agreements. They, they generally say they own everything unless it's clearly, clearly outside of the the scope of, uh, of, the, uh, of the professor's contract, or the research that they're doing. So one, one situation might be you, you invent a new bicycle. Your, your, your research is in biotechnology and you invent a new bicycle, you're probably on safe ground. But if you have anything that's in related or similar technology, you have to look at your employment agreement. It very well may be that they own all your thoughts, even if you do it outside of, of work. But it depends on different companies. Some companies are more flexible and some are not. Uh, I think their argument would be, although you did this on the weekend, you know, you're, you, you, you got some of the information, at least in part, from your work. And so if it's related in any aspect, it's hard to, to disentangle that. So it's dangerous to do. Yes? So when I think of a new job last year, so they asked you to disclose one of the current ideas that you're working on, and you gave a look to them, but it was just one line description. So how strong is that? Sure. So the question was, whenever there's a, uh, this gentleman just started a, a, a new job, and uh, and in that situation, you disclose ahead of time all the IP that you're working on currently, so that that basically says that that company doesn't have rights to that. But it, it was basically a one-liner. 
You know, it's, it's probably reasonable. It depends on how aggressive your employer is. Your employer may say, well, you know, that's not detailed enough. Uh, this doesn't exactly cover what you did. Or maybe some of it was invented before and some of it was invented at our shop. And so there's co-ownership. Uh, but, but, you know, I think if most companies are reasonable, as long as it's not spot on for what they're doing, you probably at least have a, a good argument, a, a good faith argument. I'm going to have one more slide. It's, uh, I just want to cover real quickly the BRICS. You know, the, the question is, uh, the BRICS are out there. What is the value of, of going into the BRICS, uh, and, and especially since it can be expensive? So uh, should, I, should you follow them or should you not follow them? As far as Brazil goes, uh, you know, everyone now, I'll be honest with you, most everyone that I'm working with now files in Brazil. It's pretty expensive because you've got to translate it into Brazilian Portuguese. And the downside is, is they are very, very slow. It's probably the slowest patent office on the planet. Uh, they just made the announcement right uh, a couple days ago that they're just starting to pick up patent applications that were filed in 2001. So, and that's, they're just picking them up. Uh, you know, they haven't even uh, undergone the examination. So, you know, Brazil is a 10 year lag. So, I mean, some people want you to have uh, some filing in Brazil just so it's there. It's an iffy situation. I would say if your life cycle, if your product cycle is under 10 years, it, there's no point of, in filing in Brazil. And, and even so, it's, you know, maybe it will improve, but I, I'm skeptical about that. It, it, of all the bricks, I think I would leave Brazil out. Um, Russia, Russia is useful if you are sure that you are, are likely to have a European partner. If your target audience is, I want to, I, I likely will partner or sell to a European company, they really like to have coverage in Russia. And Russia is, you know, who knows how it's going to be defended. To be honest, that's not going to be our problem. That's going to be our partner's problem. So, you know, fine, you know, protection in Russia it may be iffy, but hopefully by that time that, that, that as a situation, you're already bought out. Someone has bought your company and you don't have to worry about what's happening in Russia. So, but, but, but if it's a European partner, I think it makes sense to, to have one. India, it's relatively low cost. You file in English, by low cost, I mean a couple thousand dollars. But on the other hand, protection in India is just so uncertain. But again, maybe that's not your problem. Uh, that, that'll be your partner's problem. But it's not a bad place to file uh, because of it's not so expensive. But again, it's, you know, who knows? The, it has an unknown value. China is expensive. It really is because you've got to translate it into Chinese and the like. And everyone talks about what about Chinese protection. Let me tell you, uh, last year, China has become the number two filer in the world. So that tells me that Chinese companies are filing patents. So if you look at the number of patent filings that originate in China, they now surpass the number of patent filings that originate in Japan. They, they surpass the number of patent filings that are filed in Europe. Chinese companies are filing their own patents. And if they're filing their own patents, they're going to want protection in the United States, they're going to want protection in Japan and Europe. And so I think there's going to be ultimately a quid pro quo because how can a Chinese company come to the United States and say, we want you know, US law to protect us when there's not the same sort of protection in China for US companies that file in China. So I think there's ultimately going to be a quid pro quo. I think it's almost a must have that you have to file in China. Uh, it really does. And, and there's even ways to accelerate in China now. I'm finding that Chinese patents are granted relatively easily. Uh, they do examination, but they, they, they just tend to be very narrow. You're never going to get an umbrella patent in China, but you will get something. You should be able to get something that covers your product. South Africa, the other, the S of the BRICS, it's very un inexpensive. To be honest, in South Africa, you file a patent, they automatically grant it. It's 100% guarantee that they will grant it. It's, it's, it's almost a registration uh, effect. And so, you know, you'll get a patent in South Africa and you can list it on your estate that you have, you know, uh, patents and that. But, but if I'm on the investor side, you know, I'm skeptical about that because they're just not examined. But, you know, who knows, maybe 10 years from now, South Africa will have a good market and it'll make sense to, to have a filing there. But, 
but it is at the least it is very very cheap it's it's maybe uh, one or two thousand dollars anyways so this goes to back to the beginning why I have a patent strategy uh, you know it just makes sense to have that so you can plan your budget you can prepare for diligence and the like and uh, see I have like a couple more minutes I don't know if there's any questions on this uh, happy to answer anything if we, when we do hit nine o'clock, as Herb said, I'll, I'm happy, happy to hang out here till about ten and answer your questions personally. Yeah. It, it always surprises me that Canada is so high up in the patent protection world because, like, as an end market, it seems relatively small. I guess, how would you look at if you're if you're trying to protect an end product? You know, do you look at how big the end market is and decide? Canada is an interesting case, to be honest. And one of the reasons it's somewhat interesting is, especially in the IT space, so you want to prevent someone from setting up shop in Canada and basically providing services in Canada for the U.S. market because it's not going to be easy to stop them from doing that because all the action is happening in Canada. So, for an example, in the IT space, you almost have to file in Canada just because someone can so easily get around your patent by doing all the work in Canada. So, you know, it's not too expensive and, and, uh, and you at least uh, set that aside. Canada, although it does have a, um, a high cost benefit ratio, is often left off uh, of, of, of the list for, for many things. Pharmaceutical products, it's unknown because of reimbursement and the like. So it's something to consider. You have to look at the business opportunities there. It's case by case. I think as a business person, it's incumbent upon you to make that decision based on market size and then and go from there. There's not a broad sweeping generalization. And then just as a follow-up, what about Taiwan? Because you're not part of the TCP, do you sort of have to plan ahead for it? Yeah, Taiwan, you have to file at the one-year mark. One year after filing the provisional is the last time they can file in Taiwan. It's expensive, but you know, on the one hand, it's translated into Taiwanese Chinese which means that when you translate it into Mandarin Chinese for mainland China, you can save on the cost of translation. So you're paying a little bit up front, but, uh, but, but it depends. Again, it's a t depends on the product. You have to look at the market opportunity. It is considered one of the top 14 markets. In the pharmaceutical space, I almost always recommend my clients to file in, in Taiwan, and a lot of companies are still in the IT space are filing in Taiwan. It, it's, it's a, I think people see it as a reasonable risk to, uh, to, to invest in. I think I've hit my time. So thanks very much. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.